right, so tell us about your big anvil here, Pat. All right. Why? Why? <laughs> um, mostly because I had access to the material to do a project like that. Um, this was inspired by an anvil that I saw at the Quad State uh, blacksmithing event quite a number of years ago. Um, one of the tool sellers had one there that was about, it was 723 pounds. It was this same style that had been made in England. Um, I found it to be a very attractive uh, uh, size and shape, uh, but not within my budget. So I just made some notes about it and kind of kept my eye out for some material that I could that I could weld up to make an anvil like that if I ever had the chance. And um, I did. I did end up uh, getting access to some very heavy scrap plate. Um, the pieces that I that I used were about four four and three eighths inches thick, uh, sixteen inches wide, and uh, about forty nine inches long. And I had a have a friend who's got a, um, a flame table. He was able to take my design and and uh, torch that out. Uh, so I had two pieces that were uh, matching. Uh, this silhouette, and then to um, to aid in creating the hardy holes, we took a one-inch plate and did the same profile. So we sandwiched the one-inch plate uh, between the two thicker plates. And actually, we did it not really for the hardy holes, but because it allowed for welding uh, a lot uh, with a lot less labor. He was able to shrink that one-inch plate form slightly smaller in all dimensions than the two thick heavy plates. And in doing that, when we did the sandwich, we were left with a, with a channel all the way around the anvil, uh, uh, half an inch deep and one inch wide. And so that then was filled with weld all the way around to join the, the plates together. Um, once that was done, uh, we drilled through the, the face all the way down uh, to the bottom here um, and then counterboard that. So it has a, uh, I think about a two and five eighths inch through hole and the uh, counterbore is three inches and it's inch and a half deep. Um, I had a, a colleague uh, with a water jet who took an inch and a half plate and cut uh, a one and a half inch square hole through that plate uh, and made it three inches in diameter. And so those inserts were placed in the counterboard holes, um, bevels were ground and then those were welded in place. Um, at that point, the uh, the anvil was still, it had this silhouette, but it didn't have a three-dimensional form. It was just a giant block. And so then I created a template uh, that I could tack weld onto the uh, anvil here and use a cutting torch um, and just manually cut this, this curve on both sides. This horn has the same uh, profile here, so I used the same, same template all the way around. Um, a similar type of design uh, a technique was used to create this slope back here. Um, on this one, because it's a round horn, I then took the corners and knocked them off at 45 degrees with, with the torch. And then this was all ground to just use a big angle grinder to grind that in. Um, the additional things we had to do um, to create the feet, which are, are flared out from the, from the body by maybe four inches, um, I had a piece of one and a half inch thick plate um, that was torched to the, uh, the, the outline of the base. Um, and so then we've just welded that plate to this. this. This plate, if we move this out of the way, this base plate um, projects out from this plane by about a half an inch on each side. So there's a slight taper from this point to this point. Um, once I had the, the plate welded to this, then I just backfilled all of these areas with little bits of scrap metal and big welding rod. And so at that point, it was just a, a welding and grinding sculpture project. Once all of that form work was done, um, I did hard face the anvil uh, because the materials I was using were not particularly hard. Um, so I preheated the whole thing with some big mobile gas burners um, and then spent about, it took me about seven, seven hours to hard face this whole section here and a couple additional hours to do this. Um, and uh, so How hard. How many passes of hard face? Um, Singular pass or? It was, it was not more than two because the rod that I used, which is a Hobart product called Hard Alloy 58, um, recommends that it not exceed two. I was using a 3 16 diameter rod. And so I just laid in passes one right next to the other and just kept going and chipping off scale or not scale slag between passes uh, or using a wire wheel to clean things up. 
Um, that particular uh, rod does not require um, a lot of deformation to get hard. It's more of a self-hardening rod, but that's also why you don't want to put multiple, more than the recommended number of passes because then it'll tend to crack. Um, so once it was all uh, hard-faced, of course, it was not flat, so then it was manually ground uh, to get it smooth. Um, and it has, it has worked really quite well. I think I've, I've had the anvil complete and in use for maybe 12 years. Um, it's certainly, the, the anvil weighs just over a thousand pounds. I didn't have as a goal to make a thousand pound anvil. I was actually trying to replicate the one that I mentioned at the beginning of the clip. Um, but because of the materials I had available to me, that's what I ended up with. So, um, I'm, I've been quite happy with it. Um, in a one man shop, you don't really ever use an anvil like this, the way an original anvil this size would have been used. Um, this is a, an anvil that's designed to be used with a, a one blacksmith and one or two strikers at least. Um, and there would have been historical work like that that would have been done on a big, big anvil like this. The only time I've ever seen this specific anvil used in that manner, uh, I did do a demonstration where we were hand forging some sledgehammers. Um, and so that would have, uh, we had a bunch of tooling fitting in the, in the hardy holes for that. But I had a couple of interns from work who came out and did some forging on a Friday night one time. And one of the young men wanted to forge a ring knife that would, it was based on something from India and actually was a bracelet style knife. And he started with a, a disc um, that was nominally half or five eighths of an inch thick um, and maybe two or three inches in diameter. And he and another intern uh, manually punched a hole in that and then slipped that hole over the tip of the horn and just took turns holding it with tongs and the other one running a sledge to rotate and pound that. And that was a great example of where an anvil like this um, would have been used in a historical manner because it's got so much mash you can work way out here on the tip and the anvil doesn't want to tip off the, off the stand. So that was a lot of fun for me to watch because I don't usually get to see see that perspective because I'm doing my own relatively small work. The, I will say that having a great big flat table is really nice if you're doing a lot of straightening, which I do. Um, so I, I value that. It is nice to have a big massive anvil if you want to do some big bending with bending forks and things of that sort. Even though it's a super heavy anvil, it is, I'm going to call it semi-mobile, meaning that you can grab one end of the horn or the other and you can manually drag this around the shop. Um, it doesn't go fast, but it is, it is doable. Um, so it's not permanently fixed. And that is kind of nice. Uh, if there's, because there occasionally are times when I want to reconfigure how things are set up in here.